Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN AM for Monday, May 17th, 2021. And our top story today, your 401k data may be fair game. Joining me now to discuss this and a lot more is Austin Ramsey with Bloomberg Law. Austin, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Thank you. Look forward to it. Yeah, it's great. And, and you wrote a piece uh, really, I think, kind of keying off some of the regulatory scrutiny, the legislative scrutiny around and cybersecurity scrutiny around retirement plans and retirement plan data. What's the thesis of your article? Sure. Well, um, as you know, as a lot of people who have been studying this space know, within the last couple of years, really five years, we have seen an explosion in uh, employers having an interest in providing what, what, what they call financial wealth programs. Um, and those kind of extend beyond what you would think of as long-term retirement or health savings to emergency savings, helping an employer pay off um, student loan debt, things like that, even counseling on, on how to budget, household budgeting. Um, and as, we, as we've seen this explosion in financial wealth programs, we've also seen a lot of litigation questioning the way that third-party service providers those companies that your company is hiring to provide retirement products to you, um, the way that they use data to cross sell those kinds of products to you. And so as we see this rise in litigation, as we see this rise in financial wellness, I think my article is exploring the idea that, you know, look, we know that the Department of Labor is interested in looking in, into these kinds of areas. They've already released guidance on cybersecurity issues. They've already redefined the role of a fiduciary just, you know, last year under a Republican administration. So, you know, it's very likely, I think, that the Department of Labor is not done talking about this issue, and we could see more regulatory uh, action or guidance soon. Yeah, and really good point here in terms of, I, I think there's a couple aspects here that I'd like to explore with you. One is the consumer aspect of this and making people aware. Um, and I think, I think people are a little bit more heightened uh, in general, maybe not necessarily around retirement and financial wellness, but look, they understand, I think, that if you're using a Facebook or an Amazon or some other service, they're collecting information on you and it's, and you're, you're, it's, it can be invasive. I mean, you can see ads if you're out there searching for a Toyota uh, Venza, as an example, as I was doing out recent, going out recently, you would see ads on your system uh, reflecting the Toyota brand and Toyota Venza. But it's probably relatively new for retirement consumers. In terms of awareness, though, how do you, what do you think are the right ways to get people to acknowledge like, hey, you might see more information about financial services product, products because you are inputting all of your holistic data into this program, these programs? Yeah, yeah, Jeff, you, you make it. Well, first of all, hey, do you go by Jeff or Jeffrey? Uh, I go by Jeffrey, but it's fine. Cool. That's right, Jeffrey. Look, you know, retirement companies are collecting an enormous amount of data on you. It's, it goes well beyond just your name to your income level, to your social security number, to contribution levels, to what your retirement aspects are going to look like 10, 20, 30 years from now. Um, and that data is important. I mean, it informs third party service providers like record keepers or custodians about how best to advise you on how to save, you know, how to build that nest egg. But, you know, as we're providing that kind of data to them, right now there there isn't a lot of reg there is there isn't a lot of rules as to how those companies can use that data. So um, you know, a lot of the litigation that I mentioned, it has focused on on whether or not data is quote a plan asset. And when we talk about a plan asset, usually what we're what 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 we're what we're talking about are investments. That's the money, the dollars and cents that you put into the account and that you allow to grow. Um, and court after court after court here has said, look, this is not a plan asset. But that doesn't mean it doesn't hold value. That doesn't mean that, you know, a record keeper and your employer shouldn't be negotiating about the value that it has. And here's why. There's nothing, you know, sans a contract that prevents 
a third party uh, company from selling that data to somebody else, like a marketer or something like that. So I think what's really important, what's what's most important, in fact, is that participants and beneficiaries need to start having conversations with their employers or, uh, you know, past employers about, you know, what data is collected on them and how that data is used. And then the employers themselves need to be negotiating in the contract what ways the data can be used. Yeah, and that, that, that seems a, like a very smart, methodical approach. Now, you're in Washington, D.C., the, the federal capital, but there are states that are looking at this as well and the use of data from a consumer level. I think we've seen uh, California, uh, the largest state in the union, uh, lead the way with its CPPA, I think it's called. I always get the names wrong, but yeah. I think I got it right. And then I think New York State. So other states are kind of taking up this mantle and starting to run with this. How is data being used and what can you use data for? Sure, well, it's, uh, I think it's important that you mentioned the California Protection Act there. Um, they actually were able, I, I was able, I had the opportunity to, to talk with the attorney who worked with the attorney general in California to, uh, to carve out uh, financial advisors from, uh, from that act. So in California, at least, these kinds of, um, you know, IRA, IRA rollovers, you know, rolling over from an ERISA covered plan into an IRA, those kinds of conversations and the data that's used for them are usually covered by your employer's general disclosure. You know, in California right now, um, uh, your employer or anybody who's collecting data on you has to disclose to you at one point, at one point, they have to disclose to you the data that they've collected. Um, you know, that can come in the form of an email, that can come in the form of, you know, an, an online uh, 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 platform. But once they've met, made that disclosure, the, um, the third parties that have access to that, uh, to that data as part of the contract that your employer has negotiated, um, they don't have to make negotiate or they don't have to make disclosures. And more importantly, um, they can continue to, they can kind of continue a chain. Uh, one company to another company to another company, marketing to you, you know, high interest credit cards, um, life insurance, IRA rollovers, everything. Yeah. Uh, look, this is a, it's unsettled. I think there's a lot more that we're going to hear from this. Austin, I want to go to a quick break. and we come back, we'll talk more with Austin and privacy data and how it all is intertwined with your retirement plan. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house 
and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. We're talking to Austin Ramsey of Bloomberg Law. Austin, thanks for staying with us this morning. Absolutely. I'm enjoying but, it. Yeah, this is a fun topic. Um, it's an important topic, but a fun one to kind of discuss making people aware of what data is being used for. Uh, when you look at the regulatory apparatus, we already talked a little about the Department of Labor issuing some guidance, both for individuals and employers around this data. Uh, but what about things like the consumer protection board, finance protection board, and other entities that I think stand up for consumers. Do you foresee, in, in terms of talking with your sources and people in the article, do you foresee this, this, these entities kind of stepping up and saying, okay, wait, we want to take a look at this. We want to protect consumers as well. I think so. Um, look, the, the amount of data, that, data that's being collected is enormous and the ways that the data is being used is really unregulated. So there's it's rife for regulation, if you will. Um, I think a lot of different entities could step in. What's important, though, is that you know, a, a, you know, retirement plans are covered by ERISA, and because of that, in some respects, from a state regulatory perspective, you might say that there's a lot of room to uh, there's a lot of room to help out. There's a lot of room to protect uh, consumers, but from a federal perspective, there isn't. And here's why. Um, as soon as a fiduciary obligation, uh, in other words, you know, I'm, I'm overseeing a plan, I'm an advisor of this plan, I'm a sponsor of this plan. As soon as a fiduciary obligation is triggered, everything is ERISA, um, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. And because of that, I've really been narrowing down on the de Department of Labor. I think one really important thing to bring up here is that we've been ping-ponging back and forth between different administrations, what they call the fiduciary rule. Last year, the Trump administration um, pushed forward a, a prohibited transaction ex exemption, 2020-02. Um, and a lot of, it met a lot of criticism because it, it, it sort of um, tucked investment advisors, broker dealers, banks, insurance companies under a less than fiduciary standard. But I think what's important um, in this conversation and bringing up a, as part of part of this is that a standard was was set a standard for IRA rollovers. You know, when Fidelity, when um, when Vanguard, when they are having a conversation with you as a plan participant because your employer contracts them to provide retirement services, when they're having a conversation with you about what you should do with these funds that you've been working on. The, the, you know, this nest egg that you've been building up until now, um, you know, prior guidance has said that a rollover from from a 401k into an IRA was one time advice. And if it didn't if it didn't create, a, you know, a long term arrangement between you and this advisor, then that advisor wasn't a fiduciary. And that's important because a fiduciary has to put your interests above their own. Now. We have this new guidance that says that there's a prohibited transaction that would allow that guidance to be conflicted. You know, these big companies, they can benefit from you rolling your 401k into an IRA. Well, look, IRA rollovers are a big part of the cross selling that we're seeing these companies do. You know, I, I think an important thing to add about all of this is that over the last five years, we've seen record keeping and custodian fees dropped by over half, over, over just a five-year period. Record keepers are not making money just by contracting with your employer to provide retirement services. They're making money through emergency savings plans. They're making money through life insurance. They're making money through, um, you know, helping you pay off your student loan debt. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But as we've seen, regulatory action thus far has allowed them to make some conflicted advice. 
And, you know, in, in that regulatory landscape, we know, A, they're willing to do it, and B, we don't know how far they're willing to go. Yeah. Austin, you know, we talked in the first segment about some of the uh, fiduciary, or excuse me, the litigation around fees and around planned data. Uh, would you expect uh, just kind of with your take on, you know, writing this article, speaking with, you know, important sources that we would expect to, res- to have more uh, litigation around planned data. This is really unsettled and we would see challenges to employers, but I guess you could have individuals bring up challenges. Hey, I didn't like, you know, I received a phone call from X, Y, and Z and I didn't authorize that. Um, and then it always comes back to, well, the employer may have authorized that. So I think, do you think that this is really unsettled and we'll see more of these challenges over time? Does this give, give the, uh, the tort lawyers uh, an, op- an opportunity to, d- to go after more from these employers? Yes, we're going to see more litigation on this. There are some attorneys who, who would disagree on, 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 on me with that. And the reason is because thus far, no federal court has said that plan data is, or I'm sorry, that, that participant data is a plan asset. Um, no court has done that. But it is important to note that a number of the settlements that kind of go uncovered after the after the news stories come out, you know, where a federal judge has said, look, 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 no, no, you know, participant data is not a plan asset. We're fine here. A lot of the subsequent settlements have express, expressly forbidden these companies from using participant data unless the participant gives them their permission to do so. In other words, if I reach out to Fidelity, if I reach out to Vanguard and I say, look, I'm, I'm interested in an emergency savings program, a sidecar to my 401k. At that point, sure, they can provide this additional service to you. Um, but you have to you have to start the conversation right now. Those conversations are starting from from the record keeper. They're starting from the third third ser- third party service provider. You know, I just got an email the other day. I won't name the company. But um, I just got an email from from the from the third party service provider that that helps my own company provide retirement services, inviting me to participate in a webinar that talks about, you know, general budgeting and, and, you know, how to how to budget, how to you know balance my checking account. You know, I attended. And at the end of that, they were selling products. Um, They have access to my data. They know how much money I'm saving for retirement. Um, They can target that that cross selling directly to what my needs are. That may be a good thing, that may be a bad thing, but as we continue to see that happen in the financial wellness space, I think the litigation is definitely gonna follow. Last question here, Austin. Do you think, when you, when you think about consumers, people like yourself, your friends, family members, what are people looking for in terms of investment advice? Are they truly looking for that independent, unbiased guidance where there's not at the end of the day, hey, we did this for you, and now take a look at our three products in this area. What, what, are, what are consumers, at least those that you're talking to and friendly with, what are they looking for? Are they just looking for basic information or are they looking for product pitches? You know, Jeffrey, I think that in some cases they are looking for products, but they don't want to think that those products are gonna benefit anybody but themselves. Um, you know, we talked about that that definition of a fiduciary, the idea that the person advising you is beholden only to you and not to themselves, not to the company that they work for, but beholden only to you. Um, I think that when people um, interact with the retirement space, they have an expectation that that fiduciary obligation extends to everyone that they talk to. And that's just not the case right now. You know, by and large, that extends only to your plan sponsor. That that extends to to the company that you work for, or the company that um, that that holds your retirement investments. Other than that, you know, people who have access to your data, people who have access to very sensitive data about you, more than just your social security number, but how much you're saving, what your retirement could look like in 20 years from now. They have access to that data and they they can use it to benefit themselves. I don't think people are aware of that and I don't think people want that. Yeah, well, there's certainly this is a topic that warrants a lot of follow up. I think we're going to see in the weeks, months, years to come 
a lot of legislation, a lot of regulation, a lot of ideas around how data can be used, not just in the financial services field, but across all economic sectors. Also, we're going to have to leave it there. It's an absolute pleasure reading your article and also chatting with you. Wishing you the very best for a great week, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Thanks so much, Jeffrey. Bye-bye. And that wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, then drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the information in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. We're back again tomorrow for another exciting and educational edition of BRN AM. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.